Welcome, Feel Good Fathers, to my show with Christopher Lind. This is such a fun conversation because we were halfway introduced and mentioned to each other through a mutual contact. And then we connected recently. And I was like, off air, I was like, I know you. I know you, Christopher. (laughs) I know you from somewhere. Uh, Before we jump into that piece, uh, Christopher is the author of the Future Focused Substack, has 35,000 followers on LinkedIn. And as the way that he's been describing it to me, he's surprised by all of it. So go ahead and give his (laughs) Substack a follow. Christopher, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you so much. And uh, if if our backstage going back and forth is any indication of how much fun <laughs> this podcast is going to be, I know we're going to have a great time. And so is anybody listening to it. I'm confident in that one. 100%. We started, let's just jump right in, right? Because we've got so many topics. Yeah. I think there's so much fun we can have here. We're going to talk about tech and family. But I want to hit the hard the hard conversation first. We yeah. both have an experience where we have been in a professional context and being forced to make that decision of family or career. I'd love to hear about yeah. your decision. Yeah, so th- this was <laughs> anybody who looks me up, I won't I you I will I'll be careful how I phrase it so I don't get myself in any trouble. But essentially what it was was I was with an organization that I actually thought was going to be like one of those forever companies. You're like, it's great. I love it here. It's everything I dreamed of. And like, I'm going to be here forever. And then that moment where your boss retires, new boss comes in and you go, "Uh uh-oh, when you see who it is. Because I had had interactions with this gentleman. We had butted heads before. And I went, this is going to be tough. And um, what happened with it was, was at the time I ran a global organization, but I've always... Again, I'm very techy. And so I'd always been really successful at engaging with folks on a global level through tech. And so as a result, I'd been there for a while and had not traveled internationally because it was one of those things. I love putting my kids to bed, going on a trip. So what? I can kiss babies and shake hands. And to me, it was just one of these like, it's not worth it for me. Um, And so this new person came in and he was old school where it was like, that's what you do. That's how we do it. That's how it works. And I remember the first day we had an executive leadership team meeting and he just went, one of the first things we're going to do is as a team, we're going to fly around the world together and, you know, spend time and pound some sand with the people. And I just remember going, hmm, this is probably not going to work real well. And I remember going home to my wife and telling her about it. And she's just like, well, how's this all going to work? And I'm like, I I don't know. Like, I don't have a backup plan. Like, what are we going to do? And I'm like, maybe I'll just have a conversation with him and explain the situation. And it'll all go nice. Maybe all my assumptions will be wrong. And I remember sitting down at one of our first one-on-ones and I said, here's a deal. And I was so, I tried to be so nice about it. In hindsight, there's one thing and you'll hear what I said that I, if I could go back, I would say this differently. But I remember sitting down and saying, here's the thing. I've got a bigger family and all this stuff. I've been really successful in my role doing it digitally. And, you know, you mentioned this international travel stuff. Um, You know, for me, that's not something I'm going to be able to do. And I could just see the look on his face the second I said it, where it was like, it was a combination of, I was challenging something that he thought was critical. And also, it was like this push in authority where it was like, you're going to come tell me what you're not going to be able to do. And the second I saw the look, I went, this isn't going to end very well. And he just simply said, well, I'm just going to have to think about that. And we'll talk about it next time. And so I had two weeks and I kind of just hoped it maybe just go away. So, you know, the wife and I talked about it. We're like, I'm sure, you know, nobody's that right. You know, it'll be fine. And two weeks on the dot, He goes, here's your ultimatum. You will be where I want you to be when I want you to be there. And if you won't, you're not going to be here anymore. And I just went, wow, okay. And I just said, how long do I have to decide? And he's like, you got two weeks to decide. And I'm like, two weeks is in, I'm gone in two weeks? Like at this point, I'm just like, two weeks till I'm gone, two weeks till I have to make a decision. And then is there anything like that? And, um, at the end of those two weeks, I 
I didn't have a backup plan. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I said, well, let's get HR involved. And I guess I'm not going to be here anymore. And that was one of those moments where he was just like, wow, I'd never thought I was going to have to actually make a decision about prioritizing the two. And that was one of the first times I really had to do it. I think one of the the common narratives that exists today for fathers, uh, I would say that culturally we we sort of believe this that um, number one that most men will prioritize their career one hundred percent over their family. That's yeah, the first. It's very I think much the a first, stereotype. Yeah, the first assumption, and then the and the second assumption is that um, uh, most men don't care to prioritize their family over their career, which is another one. And there's, so I love statistics and data here. Uh, there was a Gallup poll recently. There was a, a response to a 1990s poll uh, okay. uh, recently. And the, the, I don't remember the, who it was, the, the original, but in the original, it was like 20% of men identify strongly with the role of father. And then also okay. about that same percent find a lot of fulfillment in that role. Okay. Today, so that was, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Today, over 50% identify strongly with the role of father, and then over 55%, over sorry, over 51% uh, find satisfaction and fulfillment in that role, in that day-to-day role. So times have changed. And part times have definitely of, changed. Part of the feel good fatherhood uh, way is that you do sometimes have to pick. And Christopher, thanks so much for sharing because this is very similar to an experience that I had. So when my oldest was born, I was at one position and we were sharing this a little bit off air, but I was at one position yeah. and it was a, a much more mature company, which was fun. And so there wasn't a lot of yep. like, oh, you're going home at five. That's fine. Or something like that. And I made video yeah. games. So, you know, crunch and overtime and, and the passion work and stuff <laughs> like that was very common, right? <laughs> Super common. Yep. yep. And then I went to, and then when that ended, so then my youngest would have been two. So daycare age, all that kind of stuff. I went to the new position and it was much more of a startup with a lot of young, a lot of young guys, a lot of young people working there. It was a night and day experience. I, uh, so I while you it. had a direct conversation with, with your, with the person you were reporting to, uh, yeah. for me, it was much more of a, oh, well, if he's not going to be here, I'm just going to schedule meetings around him. Like, and, and not yeah. like around my schedule, more like I'm going to start the design meeting at five. When right. He's, I'm going to exclude it. I'm going to be gonna intentional about this exclusion. Yeah. yeah. So it was this, which in this some thing. ways is actually almost even harder sometimes because you're like, you, how do you deal with that? It's, it's harder to deal with some of those because you can't yeah. just call it out directly. Uh, well, what, what was funny was that I did. And I remember that's good. Uh, that's awesome. I, I remember once we were in the, we were in the meeting and then it hit the time. I was very fortunate because the person that was my lead was not my manager. So there was okay. a separate reporting structure okay. and the lead was the one that was making my life very difficult. And, mm. uh, and so my manager was in the room and I just turned to him and I said, Hey, it's five. I got to get my daughter. I just got to go. And, he, and he's like, he was okay. And then my lead stopped me and was like, just kind of publicly chewing me out. And I just turned to him and I said, it's been more than six months now, and I've been leaving at five o'clock every day to go pick up my daughter. This was your active choice. If you want yeah. me to be involved, and I, and I do think it's meaningful for me to be involved in these discussions as a team, then you need to incorporate this. And, and I've watched you sit at your desk, and I've watched all of us, everybody in this room sit at our desks and have time to have this meeting earlier in the day. So the fact that you're starting this at this time is an active choice of choice. yours. Right. And I just called them out right in the spot on it. And um, that's so funny. Needless to say, it didn't, you know. It's always fun though when you get those opportunities. Cause so the story that ended up working out for me with that situation was yeah. what he didn't know was my mentor was the CEO. <laughs> and so I ended up just very diplomatically emailing yeah. my mentor and saying, I just want to let you know these decisions have been made and I've been put in this position. And so I'm going to I'm going to have to discontinue our mentorship sessions because I'm not going to be with the organization anymore. Oh, wow. <laughs> and it was one of those things I ended up getting pulled into all these meetings where it was like, uh, uh, you know, and at that point, I'm like, listen, I don't want my job back. I really don't. Like, I just want to figure out how I transition now because 
this isn't an environment that I'm going to be successful in any way. Yeah. Um, and so what was really funny was watching later because all my the people I knew were still there. That leader quietly exited the organization within a few months after my departure, which was one of those satisfying moments where you go, you know what, even if I'm the one that took the bullets, I hope that maybe it had a positive impact on somebody else who stayed who also would have suffered had I not done anything. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, I think it's so, again, kind of going back to, I think, the crux of this whole piece is that it's so important as fathers that we know what yeah. wall we're facing, that we know what we want in our life. Because the, you know, th this is the way I look at it. Like, even when my kids graduate and move out of the house, so I'm empty nesting, there's still years of work, right? And is it oh, worth yeah. it? And the, the, the core question is like, okay, and this is, this is part of the reasons why I left video games, because I realized that, okay, the average, the average week was between 50 and 70. That wasn't a crunch week. That was just the average week. You know, yeah. it was very typical for me to, on a regular basis, work 50 hours, you know, probably work and think a little bit on Saturday and Sunday while things were going on. And I, when I woke up, I was just like, oh man, this isn't what I want. Like, I want to hang out with my fam. This is a, a, a change in priorities. Yep. What, what's your kind of experience in that stuff? No, it, um, so for me, another one that, you know, so that was one example, but one for me was, um, I, from a career standpoint, I remember the first time, one of the first chief learning officer opportunities I got offered. I had a really flexible schedule where I was and I was like, oh, and this offer came through and it was on paper was just incredible. Um, but it was going to require me to relocate to Chicago. And it was, the office was downtown and they were a five in the, five in the office organization. And I remember just going, am I going to give this up, this flexibility that I have? And, and now for me, I grew up in a funeral home. And one of the things that was interesting being that close to death all the time was I got to see a lot of these people that made it to the end. And you saw the consequences of these like short term, like, hey, I just want to do this, or this is what's really important. And then, then like, it's too late type of a thing. So for me, it was so tough though, because I'm like, I have worked my entire career to do this. And now I have it. It's like right in front of me right now. All I got to do is sign on the dotted line. But I remember being like, I, if, if me getting this means I have to give up the time and the relationship I have with my family, so what? So I can spend two hours commuting back and forth in Chicago and then putting in 10 hour days I was like, forget it, forget it. I'm not going to do it. And I remember just being like, I can't believe I'm doing this. But like, no, I'm turning the job down unless I can stay in Milwaukee where I am and you're fine with me telecommuting. This and is... it was like, not, it, it was so hard though. It was so hard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's so funny to, uh, I, I'm a big fan of Dr. Warren and he wrote the, uh, the Boy Crisis. And okay. one of the one of the topics that that is discussed in the boy crisis is that many many fathers will uh, sacrifice something hard uh, silently for their family, right? And this is one of those yep. examples, right? You you gave up your dream, you know, like making games for me was I dreamed about that since I was an eight years old, you know, and I and I moved away from a I mean, it was like a twelve or thirteen year career at that point kind of just in there. And I, sometimes I, I, I connect with some of my buddies and they're all like doing their thing. I'm like, oh, that's so fun yeah, doing that. Of course, there was the <laughs> recent, there's the recent layoffs, you know. At, at yeah, I was going to say, kind of maybe stuff. not like right now. It's probably we, not, you know, you might, might have dodged yeah. that bullet. Not, not right now, but like, but definitely, you know, yeah. you know, seeing, seeing the, uh, the power crew together at Blizzard was, was kind of fun yeah. to watch kind of from afar. Uh, but the, the, the concept that Dr. Warren discusses in the boy crisis is that silent tear, you know, it's that silent, yep. uh, I think the example he uses is the pilot. He's the, the, he's the, the budding airplane pilot and his, his wife gets pregnant. And then the wife is like, you're not flying anymore. 
And he like, it was his passion. He loved it. They loved it. That was something that they, they did it. And the kids never, they were like the kids, uh, one of the kids confronted him when he was an adult and just said, uh, mom, and you talk all the time about being in the air and flying and stuff like that. Well, how come you never flew with us? And, and he was like, oh, well, that's interesting because your mom told me not to do it anymore. And I gave that up for you. I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, really? And I've, I've actually had that conversation with my, with my daughter where I'm just like, yeah, no, I, I gave up that tech career so I could be home with you. Yeah. So I, could, so I could do this. Well, and I think what's been interesting for me is there's these sacrifices, but if anything, it's pushed me to just have to think differently than I have before. Because what happened in that moment when I did this was I walked away from it and I said, I guess then... I guess this is a chapter I'm just going to close and I'm just going to put it on the shelf and I'll be done with it. And that's fine. And so I said, well, then how am I going to continue to do what I want to do, which is change the world for the better, like make people better. And I want to change the world. How am I going to do this if that's not the path I can take? And instead of just going, well, I guess I'm just going to give it up. I was like, okay, well, I guess I need to rethink this thing. And so I'm going to have to be 10 times better and I'm going to have to work 10 times harder and be more creative to do this. And that's actually when I really started leaning into LinkedIn and my writing and my public speaking stuff. Because I was like, well, if people are going to be skeptic skeptical of me if they don't know who I am because, well, you, you won't be here in person. Well, then I, I guess I got to show them who I am in different ways. And so it was so funny because then I just said, okay, great, I'll make this work within my environment. And then sure enough, two and a half years later, I get a chief learning offer that actually beats the previous offer. And through that process, it was like, I'm not moving, I'm not traveling. And I'm also going to continue my kind of like public figure stuff. And they were like, okay. So at the end, it was like, wait, I didn't actually have to give it up. Like I thought, mm. I just had to reimagine what it could look like and start to get creative. And that's what I've actually found with being a dad is like, yeah, the constraints. I mean, I've got seven kids. Are you kidding? Like some of my friends who are like, hey, do you want to go for a guy's weekend camping? I'm like, <laughs> call me in 20 years. <laughs> sure. Like, it's just not, it's not in the cards, but it's forced me to be different and think different about, well, then how do I build relationships mm. with other guys? How do I find the creative latitude to express myself? and I, well, I just have to do it differently. And as frustrating as it is sometimes, and I'm like, gosh, wouldn't it be a lot easier? I'm actually like, hmm, but would I want the easy path? Yeah. Because in some ways, the constraints have actually forged me in a different kind of fire than I would have been forged in had it just been like, well, just take take the path of least resistance. I, it, it's so fun because the every, everything that we're talking about is that it's the, the path that you're on has led you to where you're at and everything that you've done to this point, no matter good nor bad, has forged you into who you are today, like leveraging those words. Yep. And uh, it's it should be treated with gratitude and respect. You know, like the, the it's all part of your story, everything you've gone through, all the decisions that you've made. Uh, I absolutely, I think I adore that. That's a, that's a fantastic perspective. So feel good fathers, go ahead and rewind the video. Right now, <laughs> go back a couple of minutes and listen again. This is this perspective of the critical point being this is that you do have influence. It just may not look the way it looks for you. And yeah. in the context of like, if we're just talking a professional career, in the context of 45 years, a year or two to figure it out is nothing. It's nothing. It's a blip yeah. in that. And I think that's, you know, part of my aspirations as I started elevating my career and growing it was I actually wanted to be a role model because I think there are a lot of dads out there that go, I guess I have to give this up. And I mean, mm. it's not that it doesn't come with sacrifice, but it's this idea that, well, I guess being a good dad means I have to not have personal aspirations or I have to not be able to achieve certain things. And it's mm. like, maybe, I mean, there's times, I mean, the number of trips I turned down where it's like, Hey, do you want to speak at this or go to the, and I'm like, no, 
I mean, I, of course I would love to, but no, I'm not going to. So yeah, it comes with sacrifice. But I think sometimes that this idea that you just have to kind of relinquish that, I actually feel like that's emasculating to feel like you have to strip yourself of the things that bring you to life because, well, I just got to be a dad. And I guess that just means I'm going to make peanut butter sandwiches and watch, you know, Loud House with my kids. And you're like, well, don't just fall into that because you're just going to be a miserable person and you'll end up growing up resentful yeah. of the amazing thing that being a dad can be. Yeah, 100%. And I think the the core thing, because uh, I, I love this and I'm, I'm definitely feeling a little bit like pressure and stuff like that on this on this side because I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> I made that decision. And I, I love the context. I think I'd love to add context. The part yeah. for me that I want to move away from was the the moving, the relocate, the constant relocation. Yes. That was the part for me that was just unacceptable. And so when I did it, you know, it, it, it was long, and I don't want to get too much into, into my story because there's been opportunities for for the feel good fathers to listen to that. Uh, but, you know, I spent a good two years trying to find positions where I wouldn't have to do that. And it was very difficult. And so, yeah. Um, uh, but now I'm very satisfied. I've landed on my own two feet and uh, that gamer geekiness. I got my two, my Marvel posters right there. Stanley signed Marvel <laughs> poster right there. You know, I got my, you know, geekiness, geekiness. Yeah. All my gaming books are still in boxes. We're just figuring out the office and I still live it. I still do it, play games with my daughter. Well, and that's and... just it. You've reimagined what it looks like. Yes. It's not that that part of you had to die. And yeah. I think that's the part is that, that freedom of figuring out, I might have to reimagine this. And in my story, it worked out that I was able to find it in an albeit different way. But that's not necessarily it because that yeah. hasn't always been the case. And it doesn't have to be that. Love it. What you, you, you said something earlier I thought was really great, which was you had to reimagine friendship and community with, the, mm -hmm. with lots of kids. And uh, one of my dear friends just had his fifth child. And I, I'm just like, okay. And part of me just kind of wants to understand that. And I now have a young, I have my, my eldest is turning 12. My youngest is turning okay. two. So it's like, okay. you know, I, I feel like I have five kids, but there's just nothing in between. <laughs> just got the book <laughs> you know? yeah. Uh, but um, there, there definitely has been a, a shift. There's definitely yeah. been a shift in 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 uh, in what we can do a little bit more, like young kid availability, uh, it, 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 et cetera, et cetera. But what what was your reimagining? What was that process like for you? You know, so with seven, my oldest just turned thirteen, and so it's like thirteen, ten, seven, six four to one. Like, so it's, it's one of those, that's where I joke where it's like, Hey, you know, people were like, do you get out much? And I'm like, I mean, if you consider walking to the end of the driveway, getting I out, then I suppose. The grocery store? Do you mean the grocery yeah, store? Like, well, even that I'm like, are you kidding? Like that's what Instacart's for. Um, you know, <laughs> but so sometimes that can be very isolating mm. because some of the things that, you know, when I was first married or we only had one kid, or two kids and it was like, hey, we have guys nights and we do this. And I mean, for us, we just have to be so much more aware of things because even something like, oh, well, if one kid gets sick, well, then it's probably going to be six months we're out because by the time it circulates, right. it's going to recirculate. So we just, there's just things that we have to do where we just have to be so much more conscious of it. And it used to feel very isolating because I was like, man, like, and I think sometimes as guys too, there is something about like, well, we got to do something, you know, got to. And so I had to start going, well, that's not me. So I guess, again, does that mean that I have to just live my life alone? Mm. And I kind of decided, well, that's stupid. Like, no, you know better than this. And so for me, it's been about building different kinds of communities. And so, you know, even pre-pandemic, I had like men's group things where like, we're just going to get together and we're just going to talk about what's going on in our life. Like, and we're going to have a beer and we're just going to hang out. And, um, you know, the, like some of my, the other thing I use an app called Marco Polo, where kind of my inner circle, I'm like, we shoot messages back and forth all the time. Like, Hey, I had a really bad day today. And I know my wife won't understand this, but I know you will. So like, 
help me think through this type of a thing. And so what's interesting is it's kind of challenged this idea that, well, the only way you can really have community as a guy is if you, you know, go to football games together, or you watch the game, or, and it's like, well, no, relationship and community is more about having other people that you can be in close community with who know you and actually know you. And that's also uncomfortable because being vulnerable is a little weird. And so it takes time to kind of find those people that you can open up with and talk about. But now, what's interesting about it is I'm actually closer to some of the guys in my circle now who some of them I've actually never even met. And we joke about it. We're like, I wonder if there will ever come a day where we're actually going to meet. But we know each other. We know each other's parts of the houses. We know what's going on with the kid Because we interact on a level, it's actually created a higher level of community because we're using this technology to go, yeah, if I just had a really crap day and I'm doing deadlifts downstairs, like I'm just going to reach out to you and just go, geez Louise, like this just happened. Like, talk me through it. Am I nuts? on this type of a thing. And it's been really cool because it's taken a little while to get other people there. But now this tribe, we're like inseparable. But we would have never been had we gone, well, unless we can plan a camping trip where the four of us can go to the Boundary Waters for a week, I guess we're just not going to have a community. We would have missed out on so much. Love it. Love it. And uh if you're looking for that kind of community, shameless plug, uh, Feel Good Fatherhood Mastermind community is one of those. Just comment. Go ahead and comment. Hey, I'm I'm interested. Send me some info, and we'll we'll, get, <laughs> we'll set something up. Uh, this is this is so critical, right? It's so critical and so related to what you're about, future focus, tech experience, interactions, that whole jazz. One of the things that's been surprising to me so much, uh, directly related to what you're talking about, is the depth and scope of experiences and relationships you can build not being proximate, not being yep. face-to-face. I love the technology era that we're in. I love, I, I, I just recently told somebody that never thought it was fa- fa- uh, possible. I knew of a couple that met while playing EverQuest, which was this old MMO. It was like a community-focused oh, game. Oh, I know it. <laughs> right? So for, for, those, for those that aren't aware, it's like it was kind of like this chat room. The way that I used to describe yep. EverQuest was it was a chat room, but there was a D&D game kind of on it. And so you could you could play, you could build groups and adventures and conquer things and slay the dragons, literally slay the dragons and 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 have a good time. But they met on the game. They then they met in person, started their romance, then they got married, had a family, the whole thing. And that was just all that. And I was in school when I was doing this. And I just remember saying, even back then, this was in ninety so ninety nine through two thousand three. That's when I was in school. Okay. So even back then, just saying, wow. What, how privileged and how lucky we are that we can hang out here where I'm meeting these amazing people through a diverse background. I would hang out with lawyers and CEOs and stuff like that. And I was some numb college kid doing not nothing, you know, <laughs> just like yep. studying, studying yep. whatever, and just interacting with these people and building relationships and, and community on these, in these virtual experiences. And of course today it's like, uh, super different, right? Like we're, we're entering the world of VR helmets and augmented reality. And you, you might build your, you might build a connection through somebody through Slack that you only ever see yep. their text. And, uh, yeah. uh, I think it's, it, it, life is rich. Life is rich. Well, and I think what's interesting about it is I think what it's done is it's exposed how little we, many people actually understand about human relationships. You know, we've just kind of often And I built my whole career around this. Like part of what I've done is help organizations challenge this idea that certain variables that they see as just immovable objects, that it's like, it's not an immovable object. It's just a variable in a broader equation. You just solve for X. Like, and so when it came to relationships, this was always something where I was like, I don't think we understand them because we've just always gone, well, I mean, relationships are this. And you're like, but have you actually deconstructed it down to the level of what makes a quality human relationship? Because once you do that, then you can start to reconstruct it in different ways. I mean, can you have empty and meaningless relationships online? Well, of course you can. But can you have empty and meaning relationships in person? 
Of course you can. Like it was one of the things we saw with the <laughs> pandemic. We're like, these people all of a sudden were remote and they're like, wow, I just thought we were so close, but I guess we're not. And it's like, well, no, you weren't. Of course you weren't. Just because you bumped into each other and shared a coffee in the break room, you didn't actually know that person at all. Yeah. So you, you open the door. What are the components of a, of a strong relationship? What, what is this? Yeah. Um, you know, I think some of the ones, and this has to do with a lot of the work I'm doing right now on leadership development mm. is, you know, really deconstructing authenticity and vulnerability sure. and trust, you know, is, is the time and energy that you're spending. Are you building a trusting relationship? Like, can you say things to a person and know that that's in the safety of those two people? And rather than just react to it, they will hear you and understand and ask questions like that kind of stuff builds a deeper relationship. The like authenticity, I think, especially right now in the digital age, it's so easy to be different versions of yourself. Like, oh, this is the, the Facebook version of me. And then there's the LinkedIn version of me. And then there's the, you know, real version of me type of a thing. Instead of going, why not just be you all the time? I love this concept. It, it's, it's one of the things that I really want all feel good fathers. I want all people to reconcile is that fractured nature, that fragmentation yeah. of your psyche, of your, your mental health, of your mental state. The, uh, I learned this from my great aunt years ago and I loved it. And what she told me was this, and it, it's kind of innocuous and people were like, sure, of course, this is a great statement, but I've, <laughs> I've taken it in general. But what she said was, um, you know, I always tell the truth, so I never have to remember what I've said. Right. And I was like, wow. I was like, <laughs> how freeing. Because I, I think she made a, a, a comment about something like about like not remembering something. And I was like, oh, well, how do you navigate that or something like that? And then she said, oh, well, I always tell the truth. And so you never have to do that. And, and it's really funny because I just had a client, a call with a client yesterday. and. It was, it was interesting. So they had brought, they had a, a, somebody was promoting a brand deal. They were negotiating sponsorships and stuff like that. Okay. We were discussing and then he, had, he, had, he was like, okay, make or break. Give me the answer to this question. And I was like, well, blah, 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 blah. And then, uh, and I was like, well, you should be doing this strategy. And then he was like, I don't know if you remember, but you told me that long ago, blah, blah, blah. And you're telling me this. And I was like, well, I'm nothing, at, I'm nothing if not consistent. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> so... <laughs> I was like, this is the strategy you should be pursuing. This feels like a distraction to me. This is like not worth your time. It's not your brand. I mean, branding, it's, it's yeah. not with your brand. It's somebody else's product. Yes, if you love it, great, promote it. But honestly, you're building this thing over here. This is a distraction. Focus over here. This is what we should be doing. Yeah. And um, uh, it's it's super related to the work that we're doing here. And Father, this kind of whole conversation, but the there shouldn't be a fragmentation. There should There should always no. be a focus. If you're managing, if you're managing different relationships, I, I think the only, I think the only place where this would be meaningfully present would be if you're talking up and down a chain, you know, if you're talking to, you know, like I, if I'm talking to my CEO, like they're going to have a different level of information that they're going to want. Well, and I think there's here. a difference, there's a difference between personalizing who you are yes. versus being a different person. Yes. You know, there's a very big difference between, okay, I'm personalizing certain things based on the audience, but I'm not a different person. I'm not a different version of myself. I'm just maybe filtering or, ch you know, changing things through. Because I've seen this in the past where I've done career stuff with people, career coaching, and they're like, well, I just, I don't wear dress clothes, so I'm not going to dress up for an interview. And you're like, okay. And you're wondering why you're not getting a job. Like, yes. I'm, I'm just telling you, like, there's a certain level of just, well, I don't like to wear, I don't, I only wear tank tops. Like, okay, that's not who you are. There's different things where you can personalize without that. But I mean, I feel like that's so much more freeing and it actually frees up so many things. I think of one instance when I was at GE, we lived five minutes. I maybe went in five times in the four years I was there. But I remember one time I went in to this big thing and we were all there. And a bunch of people came up and we were talking and they went, oh, this is kind of like anticlimactic. And I was like, that's an odd statement. Like, what do you mean by that? They're like, no, meeting you is kind of anticlimactic. And I was like, what does that mean? And they were like, 
Well, I just kind of expected like you'd be so different in person and you're you're exactly the same. And I was like, well, I actually take that as a compliment then. <laughs> Cause I'm like, that's how it should be. Like you shouldn't be like, oh wow, I got to meet the real version of Chris versus the artificial version of Christopher. And I was like, well, I guess, yeah. So it, it is interesting. That's that's fascinating. That, that's really fascinating. I I want to kind of shift this conversation sure. into digital. Because mm -hmm. I, I think part of your expertise is about experience, experiential design, AI, yep. tech. You know, mm -hmm. I, it's kind of been implied without specifically saying that you're primarily remote. Like as, as a physician, you're like me. I'm prim like this, this office that you are watching on YouTube or you're listening through uh, on the audio platforms. Uh, this is where I spend the majority of my time. <laughs> so <laughs> yep. like, this is it and i love it and that's why it looks the way it does that's why i have the the wall paint the way yeah. the way it is et cetera. Et cetera. Uh, i would love to hear like legit like what's top of mind when it comes to this concept as it relates to what we're talking about so what's interesting about this is i actually just recorded a separate podcast called parenting in the digital age mm -hmm. because one of the lessons that i learned growing up was I was super tech savvy. I was that computer geek that knew how to do everything. And my parents were definitely not. And so as a result, there was kind of this separation of like, well, we don't really know what he does. I don't really understand it. So we'll just be kind of like hands off. And when I was having this conversation, I talked about, to me, that's a real risk as a parent because I ended up discipling myself in technology and anybody who's been around technology knows how dangerous this is. And it's only getting more dangerous as we move forward, as we move into the AI age and the, you know, experience XR range and all these things where you're like, whoa, the things kids can play with today are light years more dangerous than they were in the past. And there can be this tendency to kind of go, well, but I don't understand it. And my kids seem to be really tech savvy. So I guess I'll just let them figure it out. And so like when I think about fatherhood, like I spend a lot of time discipling my kids, not in how the technology works, but how the way the world works and how things work and how technology fits into that so that they recognize what they're dealing with and how to think intelligently about it and make wise decisions on things like, well, social media, like what does that do and how does it form your identity and how do you think about these things? And I think it's one of those things where there is this easy tendency as parents to go, boy, I don't get it. So I'm just staying out of it. And so I think about as we move into this digital age, how much more important it is to lean in on this area. I love the Incredibles 2 movie. There's a sequence where, oh, is it Dax? Yeah, it's Dax. That's the yeah. Dash, da Dax or Dash. One of those. The son comes home. He's got the new math homework. And yep. then they, they kind of get into it. Mr. Incredible and the kid, because because mom's out. Elastigirl's out doing <laughs> yeah. Elastigirl stuff, right? Yep. So they're they're doing their thing. And then, and he's like, I don't know. I think like I think on camera he's like I don't know how to do math this way. And like and so they they get into it and they uh, they blow up and then he has this crazy I think like and then um Jack Jack the baby manifests his powers and the raccoon and is his slapstick yep. very entertaining fun We sequence. we just watched it. Yeah. <laughs> and then but I what I love was he spends the night and he just studies and he studies the yep. new form of math and he goes and you, and you get the implication that he goes through the entire textbook like in a night. And so like, yep. and I think of when I think of what you're talking about and I think of the state of fatherhood, that's the model. It's not, it's not the, well, I'm a sports dad. This is my common example. I'm a sports yep. dad. And so I only understand throwing the ball out back. And then the son's like, but I like, I love video games and I love this tech stuff. And, and it's, that and so my father growing up was a former linebacker in college so football okay right so he had yep. a very physicality he was a very physically very physicality bent and i was like yep. i'm i always i'm i'm tall i'm 6'1 but i'm kind of yeah. slight i'm not muscular or big 
I've always been this way. I, and even though I did play hockey, even though I did play football, I was like, I love video games. I love this stuff. Yep. Uh, but we never did. We never connected mutually there. Whereas what I would say today would be, okay, well, if you're the sports dad or if you're the video game dad and your son is the opposite or your daughter is the opposite, just find the, in, find the intersection. Yep. So it could yeah, be. I, it's go ahead. it's so true. And, and that's where, like, I mean, as an example, I don't, I like video games. I don't like Minecraft, but my kids love Minecraft. Yeah. And so I've taken time to, and every night we spend multiple hours together upstairs just talking about sure. life and like, yeah. what is it about my, and I really seek to understand, not this like, I'm dad, I think it's stupid, you know, or what, just like, tell me about, help me understand, like, what is this parkour stuff you do? Like, can you show me? Like, help yeah. me understand why. And like, now we have fun watching goofy YouTube videos of stuff that happens on my, and I don't really get it, but I'm like, they know I care about, but what's interesting is there's always these like life lessons yes. that aren't related to Minecraft that now I can connect with them on a personal level that's in their language. And it was a similar thing when I turned 40. For some reason, the kids all wanted, got into skateboarding. And I'm like, I haven't, I rode a skateboard like once when I was 10 and probably broke my wrist, but it was so important to them. And so I was like, okay, like I'm going to buy us all skateboards and I'm going to learn with you and I'm going to do this. And that's not related to the tech, but it was just this like genuine interest in wanting to meet kids where they are instead of going, well, I'm the dad. You have to meet me where I am if we're going to have a relationship. And that for me was just a fundamental shift. That just feels like maturity to me. It feels like, you know, as a, as a mature adult, we're, we're kind of entering an age where we're not producing mature adults. We're not willing to engage. We're not willing to have hard, hard conversations. We're not willing to sacrifice anything. And no. it's, it's creating this weird society where people don't have an identity. They have they have no resiliency. They're not able to navigate certain things. They can't even communicate their needs. I, I heard this one. I heard, I heard it was something now today. It was something like 95% of people are unable to express to their romantic partner what their needs are. And I was like, wow. Like, I couldn't imagine. I couldn't imagine saying, hey, wife, I've had a, a rough day. I, you know, and, and stuff like that. And, and she's fantastic. And, and we have a very good relationship. So, and we're very open to different things. And yep. we do that. Do you need me to listen, help you solve it or do this? And, and this yep. is and what I love about that question is that is, is this, and this is the truth that I found and Christopher, maybe you experienced as well, but I found a hundred percent of the time, the answer is always, will you just listen to me? <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Every once in a while, it'll be like, I don't know, what do you think? But sometimes like in that moment, I'm like, right now, I actually am interested in what you think. Not right now, though. Like yes. right now is not the time. Yes. 100%. I am interested. Yeah. Not now. Yes. I just need to get this out and I need you to just let me get it out. And, and what I love about, and I think, and I, I'm sure that Christopher, you experience this as well, because I experience it. And I, and I, we, I feel like we have a good, a good boundaries and good relationship with our spouses. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, even sometimes I've had a crap day and I walk out and I can see that she's had a worse day. And I'm like, you know what? Yep. I'm just going to wait and just show up positively. Cause I also know that she has done that for me. And so, and, yes. and, and I also know both of us have done it for our daughter, our oldest yeah. daughter. Cause our, our young, you know, one and a half and two year olds don't have bad days, <laughs> right? They just, they just want to be picked up and held and play. Like, yeah. That's it. Well, their, their bad days are so much easier to recover from because they just yeah. have it and you just like, you know, tickle them for a few minutes and their bad days all gone. <laughs> if only that was but the I truth of the point, world, right? Yeah. I know, I know. <laughs> but, you know, I think the point that is so true in this that I think for me, I've taken just very personally, and this, this goes into my leadership philosophy and everything is like, leadership is about sacrifice and service. And so I think as I lead my family, it's like, it's not that I don't have needs. It's that I always look as my needs coming secondary to the people around me and being that role model, because when you're that role model, other people, they do the same back. 
because instead of this competition of land grabbing, it's like, wow, well, if, if dads, I mean, cause like Mike, I work from home. They know when I have a bad day, mm. but they see me go, I'm not going to let my bad day bring down everybody else's day. And it's so cute because there's nights my kids will literally be like, I, it sounds like you had a bad day, dad. What happened? Like, I won't even ask, but they're the ones that ask because they know I need to talk about it, but mm. they, they, they know I won't. They know I'm not going to make this about you. And then it's so interesting how they go, what happened today? You know, that meeting sound. And I'm like, what, what are you doing? Like, what? but it's so cool. The cycle of that sacrifice. And when there's that mutual sacrifice to one another, it just runs better. What, uh, I think what a fantastic lesson for feel good fathers to, to navigate, uh, Christopher outside of say your LinkedIn and your Substack. Are there other ways that folks that are either interested in hiring you or have you speak for them or interacting with you that they can do so to interact with you? I mean, really LinkedIn is where I'm most interactive in Substack. Uh, you know, all my writing is on on Substack. I'm very active on LinkedIn. And, um, you know, I think there's a lot of people who they're on LinkedIn, but it's not really them. It's like their PR team or, or whatever. Like for me, it's like me, which sometimes surprises people. They're like, oh, oh, you responded to this. I'm like, well, yeah, because it's actually coming to me. So those really are the big ones. I mean, I have a YouTube channel that continues to grow, but it's really just more of a place that other people can consume my content and then my podcast, you know, but that's, they're all kind of interconnected. So if people are actually trying to get in touch with me, LinkedIn is actually the easiest way to just be like, hey, here you are. Awesome. Uh, Christopher Lind, everybody.